Well, we're so thankful that Bethel has just really become our family over these past 13 years that we've been able to pastor here and not just family, but our best friends and not just for us, but for our kids. Um, some of you are their mentors, their teachers. Um, you've given them spiritual foundations that we could never have as parents. And we're so thankful for you. Uh, we are genuinely going to miss our church family here. Um, but you have given us so many amazing memories, so many great things to stand upon, um, so many friendships that are going to last a lifetime. We've watched our kids grow up here and get baptized here, and you guys have done the same and just encouraged us along our walk. No matter what we were going through, you were here for us, and we're so thankful for that, and we're genuinely going to miss you so much. Again, Pastor Jared talked about it being Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem and people celebrated him as the king. You, he, they waved palm branches and they thought, thank you, Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king, all these great things. But we know just a couple days later, those same people would shout, crucify him, crucify him. But then came Easter Sunday. So in this, can you, you hear me now? Hope you can. So I, I don't know what it is, but sometimes when it's your last weekend and you just want to make it count and you really want it to be the best, I think the enemy just wants to come in and take his way. So I appreciate our tech team getting us fixed up right away. I, I'll tell you, when I look at what we want to do in our last weekend with you, is we want to present to you a charge, which is really an exhortation of what we believe God has spoken into our lives as principles over the years of ministry, the years of pastoring, and we want to be able to just instill that into you. We want you to get out something to write some notes down so you can take some notes with us because we really do see this as some principles that have changed our lives, and we want them to change yours. So I'm going to hit this off. With everything that's happening in the world there's a principle that God's been working in us, and not just in the past few months, but really the past few years, he's been teaching us this. And it's so timely for what's happening right now. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Do not make decisions out of fear. Right now is a very scary time to be alive. We know that there's this global pandemic happening, and people are getting sick and dying all across the world. We know that there are... Um, earthquakes happening in unusual places, tornadoes who are destroying cities. We also know that food and supplies are suddenly being rationed. We have an entirely new normal, and it would be easy for us to be captive to our feelings, to our emotions of fear. It's really what rules the airways, whether you're watching social media or the nightly news, fear rules the day. But fear sets out to paralyze us. It, it just starts building up in us, and you can feel that anxiety until it's literally almost choking you out. But Jesus' disciples and his followers felt this same kind of fear. In John chapter 16, all of a sudden there was this unsettledness. Jesus was saying, I'm going to leave you, but I want to leave you with these words. In John chapter 16, verse 33 says this. Jesus is speaking to them, and he says, I have said all of these things to you. That in me, you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When we look around at all that is happening, when we listen to the nonstop news feed, it's easy to get overwhelmed and to get scared and to, and to just curl up and stop life. But that's not what God's called us to. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. We, just because we feel it doesn't mean we have to give in to it. That's right. When we give in to that spirit of fear, it's actually revealing who we put our trust in. It's revealing where we put our trust. Listen, Jesus said that in him we can have peace. We can rest he said, the world's going to give you tribulation, and that's all the more obvious right now in the times that we're living. But in him, we can have peace. In him, we can rest. God has given us power, love, and self-control. And other versions, the one that I kind of memorized and stated before, is that he's given us a sound mind. Worrying will never work. That's right. But worship always works. Trusting in God always works. We have to align our feelings with our faith. 
And Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is never going to leave us. Not in the middle of this, not ever. We can trust in that, and we don't have to make decisions out of fear. I think it's critical for us that we do not make decisions out of fear. And and the next charge that I want to give you is closely related to this last one. But let faith push your risk. Let faith push your risk. You know, I think a lot of people, and myself included, I find myself at times... I want to look at the calculations. I want to process them. I want to calculate what the risk is before I'm going to take a step. You know, we do that in business. We take calculated risk. We do that in church sometimes. We take calculated risk. But I think when we start coupling our heart with the Spirit of God and what God wants us to do, we've got to let faith sometimes push our risk. Because I think when we do not let that happen, then we don't get ourselves into God territory. God territory is where, where risk and faith collide, and that's where God does the miraculous. That's right. And we have to be a people that are the miraculous, now more than ever, that we would allow faith to push our risk. I want to share with you James chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. This is what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It is critical that our faith and works, in other words, moments of faith and moments of risk collide together where God does the miraculous. Let faith push your risk. That's so good. And I think it really leads us into charge number three. This is super simple, but something that we've learned in the past several years is the importance of the words that we speak. And so charge number three is just this. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's really that simple, and it doesn't require a lot of explanation, but I want someone to know that I'm dependable, someone that's not fickle or fake, someone that doesn't just change because they feel like it. I want to be someone that others can rely on, and the Bible even talks about this, Matthew 5, verse 37, it says, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. It's really the follow-through of our words that's important that people are looking at. Words are easy to come by. Words are easy to say. And too often we say one thing and then end up doing another. But God's people need to be known as dependable and trustworthy. Because the truth is, is that our feelings very easily change. It's easy to commit to something when you feel inspired, when the spirit moves you, when other people are around you and you just kind of go with that crowd mentality. It's very easy. But then all of a sudden those feelings kind of Wayne, and and then you're not really feeling it anymore, and it's easy to just say, well, yeah, I'm not feeling that anymore, and so your commitments wane also, but your actions shouldn't be dictated by the next wave of your emotions. Turn that around. Let your emotions be dictated by your actions. Love even when it isn't easy. Serve when you don't feel like it. Give even when you don't want to. That's right. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's that simple. I think even in our personal lives, there's been moments, whether it's been church on Wednesday night and you're serving in the nursery or even just getting up to come to church on a Sunday morning, I think there's different times where whether it's a small group or whatever our participation level is, there's a moment that hits us where, and we've had these conversations all the time, where we go, "I, I don't feel like doing this. But yet we hold each other accountable and we say, no, we committed to this and we step forward. And it's funny, I think every time we come back from those moments, we look at each other, oh, you you won't believe the conversation I had. You won't believe what God did. And I'll tell you, that's when the yes matters. That's when that no matters. That's when your word matters. Follow through on that because even if you don't feel it on the front end, I'm telling you, God shows up on the back end more times than we can count, right? 
I'll tell you, it's amazing. You know, one of Melanie and I's favorite things here at Bethel over the years has been Connection Point. Connection Point is a class where we get to know you, you get to know us, you get to know the heartbeat of the church. And it's one of those places where we get to hear your story and you get to hear our story. And if I could just take a quick commercial break real quick, I wanna say this. Uh, we have Connection Point that happens on a regular basis. Well, we're gonna be in this season offering Connection Point online, and I would encourage you to go to Bethel.ag, sign up for Connection Point, because it's a great way to be connected to the church, great way to hear the heart of the church, and us to hear your story. And this brings us into the next point that I hope you will live out with your life, is let others hear your story. Let others hear your story. Your story matters. We really believe here at Bethel that, that everyone matters to Jesus, everyone matters to us, but in doing that and living that out, your story matters. Your story matters because it's where your story and God's story collides. It's in that moment, just like faith and risk collide, it's in that moment where God shines, even in your weaknesses, even in your struggles, Mark 5, 19 says this, Jesus said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Every one of us has got a story about how God came into our life, brought us mercy and forgiveness and grace. That story matters. People need to hear that story now more than ever. Let other people hear your story. It's the testimony of your life where God met you in your darkest hour that brought you through something. It matters how God interacts with your story. Tell that story to other people. Let other people hear it. And I think when we consider how our stories matter, it's even how, how our story and our pain point sees God inter intersect with that. And God comes in to that part of our story. Pain is one of those those four-letter words that we'd like to call a curse word. I mean, pain is really that kind of a perspective. We'd soon avoid it. Like, we'd rather take pills to make sure that we don't feel the, the uh, physical pain that we might have sometimes. We'd rather take other substances to dilute the emotional pain that we might have. And the reality is, is pain is something that we need to cherish, accept, and realize that it's a tool that God uses in our lives. So it brings us to this next charge that we want to exhort you in, is let pain teach you. Let pain teach you. That's hard to say, but it's critical that we do this. Pain has to teach us, draw us in, move us through, because there's something that God wants to do even in the middle of your pain point. When I think about how our story matters, it's when we've talked about our marriage problems, when we've talked about our personal problems, when we've talked about how God came into the middle of those pain points, it's when that is spoken that people go, I, wait a second, I wanna hear more of that. Yeah. I wanna hear more of that part of your story because I need to know God can meet me in my pain point. Right. Let pain teach you. Let it be the vehicle in which people open up and hear what you have to say and let it be the instructor that brings you through something that God wants to reveal to the depth of your heart. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul, that he is, he is speaking to God and he's pleading with God that he would remove a thorn from his side, that he would say, I, I don't want this God, would you please take it from me? Now it's interesting as we look here in a moment in 2 Corinthians that we don't know what his thorn is. And I think that matters because what we do in our society, in our world today, is we compare our pain to somebody else's pain. Right. And when we do that, we're missing what it's supposed to teach us. Don't compare your pain to somebody else's pain. Their pain is their journey. Your pain is your journey. This was the Apostle Paul's journey. And he never, we never fully understand what the thorn is, but look at this, this is a credible verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, this is what God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Your pain point, when 
God comes into the middle of it, you are absolutely weak. You feel like you're at the end of your rope. And you might feel you're there already, right here, right now, in the middle of this season of seclusion. And you feel like you have nobody around you. You don't know how you're going to pay your bills. I'm telling you, in the middle of this pain point, in the middle of your weakness, let God come into the middle of it. Let him be glorified in your weakness. Let him be the one who is championing you and bringing you through. You can't do it in your own strength. Let him do it through you. And if I may take a moment just to speak to those of you that are leaders, those of you who have influence. One of my favorite books is Leadership Pain by Sam Chand. And, and he says this in his book, the level of your leadership will be determined by the level of your pain tolerance. I will tell you, pain is an incredible teacher. And if you wonder why you don't have influence, if you're wondering why this is happening or why that's happening, I will tell you, if you'll pray a different prayer and say, God, would you help me to deal with the pain? Would you help me to be able to walk in the pain? Would you help me to learn from the pain? Would you teach me in this process of pain? I'm telling you, God will take you to new places, new heights, and he will be glorified in and through you. And sometimes when you're talking about pain, if you've caused your own pain through bad choices you've made, or it's kind of easy to forgive yourself and just turn things around, right? Just start making different decisions. And sometimes that's a little bit easier than if someone caused the pain to you. Hmm. And when someone else has done something to you, it's a little bit harder to deal with. It's a little bit harder to swallow. And so often we want to justify our actions and we want to make yeah. sure to stand up and defend our name. And we want other people to know that we were right and they were wrong. And yeah. this is how it really happened. But this leads us into our next charge. And sometimes it's easier said than done, but I want to challenge you with it today. Let the Lord vindicate you. Yeah. Let the Lord vindicate you. And we read this in Exodus 14, 14, and it's such a simple verse, but so powerful that God has used multiple times to remind Jared and I yeah. over the past several years. And it just says this, the Lord will fight for you. Yeah. You only need to be silent. The Lord will vindicate you. Maybe things happened on purpose. Maybe they didn't. This side of heaven, we will never actually know all the details and the intentions of someone else's heart. All we know is our side of the story. And so, easy, so many times we just want everyone else to know our side of the story, right? Yeah. To prove that we were right. We want to justify our actions. But again, we have to align our feelings with our faith. That's right. God alone knows and he alone is our vindicator. And I want to share one more verse with you on this point. Psalms 135 verse 14 says this. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. God is that good. You can trust yeah. him to be that much for you. You don't have to keep spouting out. You don't have to make sure things are posted on Facebook and this happened and that. Listen, God will vindicate you. So good. God is who he says he is. And this is my last charge to you. Let God be who he says he is. Because the truth is, he is good. That's right. He is compassionate. He is slow to get angry. He is abounding in love. He is gracious and kind. God is our shield, our fortress, and the rock that we can stand on. He does not change and he is not shaken. He has conquered sin and trampled over death. That's right. He is almighty and victorious. He is our deliverer and our very present help in times of need. He is Emmanuel, the God that came to earth to be with us. He is not contained by time or space. He is more than we could ever ask for or even imagine. This is who God is and so much more. It is time for us to move these yeah. truths from the pages of the Bible and not just to our head, but to our heart, to know them, to trust in them, to live by these truths that God is who he says he is. That's right. And he will do what he said he will do. That will never change. We can rest in that. That's so good. This final charge that I want to give to you it comes from something that's in my heart that I believe that God's just put a, uh, just a calling on my life to do. And, 
and it's just being able to call out vision, whether it's in the church or in an individual. And, and I want to say this because so many of you I've had the privilege to walk with over the years as we've pastored here and called out what God has spoken over your life. I'm so proud of you that you said yes. And for those of you that are sitting on the sideline that are wondering, you know, what do I have to offer? I'm telling you, God has a vision and a plan for your life. Amen. This is that final charge. I want you to hear this, not just even as the whole church, but as an individual. Let vision rule the house. Let vision rule the house. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I wanna say this very clearly to you. As the entire body of Bethel, what should rule the day? Vision. What has God spoken for the direction and the next steps? Vision. That's what should rule the house. Not fear, not emotions, not feelings, not circumstances, vision. If you will continue on that path, Bethel, I will tell you, you're anointed and called to be a beacon on a hill that will change this region. That's right. There's so many more lives. There's so many more lives in this context that are waiting to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your vision as a church, your calling as a church matters. Do not waver, do not wane, do not struggle but keep that the focal point. Let vision rule the house. To those of you that are individuals wondering, what do I have to offer? God has declared great plans and steps over your life. If you will say yes to him, he will carry you through when you feel like you have nothing to offer. He will anoint you when you feel like you have no gifts to bring. He will order your steps when no man can do it. He will light the path. He will bring you through. That's right. There's about to be a wave of souls, I believe, coming to the kingdom of heaven. I believe that this pandemic that is sweeping the world and our country is a setup for an awakening of people's hearts that are saying, I need a savior, I need a God. And you are part of that solution. I want to challenge you to get ready. Get ready for the wave of souls. God has anointed you for such a time as this. Get ready. Get off the sideline. Don't use your quarantine as a place of excuse. You can get on social media and declare the goodness of God. Amen. You can email your friends and say, God is with you. You can text someone and say, God has got a plan for you. You can make a difference right where you are. And I want to tell you to get prayed up because the kingdom of heaven is about to shift. It's about to change. And Bethel is poised right now better than ever to take any hill that God says, take that hill. I've got vision for you to take that hill. I got vision for you to take that community. I got vision for you. And if you'll let vision rule the house, God's gonna get all the glory. Amen. Amen. It's such a powerful word. And as we are closing today, Pastor Jared's gonna pray his blessing over you in just a minute. But before he does that, I just wanted to read a, a scripture that I think is very pertinent to what's happening today. And it's Psalm 91, but I don't want you to read it from your Bibles. I want you just to close your Bibles and just listen to several passages of this chapter. Psalm 91 says this, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in who I trust. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, 
but it will not come near you. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges me. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. So good. So good. Just a moment, I want to pray over you as I have every week a blessing over you and your home and your place of work. In just a moment, I want to pray that, and I hope that you'll receive that blessing, that prayer over your life and over your family. But on behalf of the Strong family, my wife and I and our kids, you know, as we've said, our kids have grown up here. Um, They've been baptized here. They have served the Lord here. Uh, From my son today playing drums for the last time in worship with you to my daughter being able to be on the worship team of the kids' ministry We have had the honor to serve you these 13 years. And we're so proud of you. And we're so thankful that you let us learn and grow into our leadership as shepherds. Thank you for letting us do that. We hope that we're leaving a legacy of serving well. We hope that we are challenging you to pursue Jesus with everything that you've got. That you'll be ready for the awakening that is coming in people's lives truly believe the best is yet to come for Bethel. Under the leadership, the staff, and people who call Bethel home, I believe you're going to change this world. I'm so proud of you. If you would, just open up your hands as an act of surrender to receive this blessing one last time as Melanie and I pray this over you and believe the very best for you. Father in heaven, I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice. I pray that your face shine upon them. Give them peace. Give them rest. Lord, I pray for their homes, their businesses, their places of work that they be filled, God, with your incredible presence. Lord, I pray for their finances, that they'll have everything that they need. And in turn, they'll live out lives of generosity. Lord, I pray for their children and their grandchildren, that they'll walk in your goodness, walk in your favor, and walk in a relationship with you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Amen. We love you with all of our hearts. We wish you the very best, and we will be praying and watching all that God will do through Bethel, and we can't wait to stay connected with you and speak blessing over your life. In Jesus' name, God bless you.